Hello everyone, welcome back to the PMF IS Current Affair Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and today we are going to discuss uh, part number 2 of our test number 3. And in this particular video we are going to pick up the question 21 to question number 40 and every question will be discussed in a most comprehensive manner. But before we begin the discussion I have a very special announcement to make. Well guys, uh, as you know that this entire test series is going to be uh, consisting of 10 quality test meaning 1000 high MC high quality MCQs but now the price is being dropped now you can get the entire number of tests in just 499 it's a special price and it is going to expire very very soon it's a limited time offer so if you are interested to uh, really practice something qualitative I want you guys to check out the link it is given in description go and check out and get the test series at a very special discounted price but for a limited number of time so I want you guys to check out the test series once. Now this, uh, this uh, question number 21 which was asked in your exam. This question was with respect to the Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar award. It's a very very important award when it comes to Indian science research and development. Well this particular award is considered to be India's top annual science award. The word annual is important so please pay attention. It's given every single year. This award is given by Council of Scientific and Industrial Research which is better known as CSIR and this award is given in the honor of this person uh, Shanti Swaru Bhatnagar who was the founder director of the CSIR. Now please understand this particular uh, uh, award it is given in seven disciplines that includes biological, chemical, earth, atmos atmosphere, ocean, planetary sciences. Also it includes mathematical, engineering, medical and physical sciences. These seven disciplines if you are doing any research and development you are likely to get this award if you are doing exceptionally well. When it comes to the eligibility of this award any citizen of India whosoever is up to the age of 45 the age criteria is very special so be attentive with that. Any citizen of India who has done great research work in the field of those seven particular fields that we have discussed and have the age of 45 then a person is eligible plus other than being citizen of India even the overseas citizen of India and the person of Indian origin both of them who are working in India they are also eligible to get this award but very carefully even if you are OCI or PIO but you should be working in India it's not like that you are working in some other country then you are not eligible but if you are working in India even these two categories are eligible for this particular award and very importantly pay attention to the statement number three the, this particular prize it is done for all the work that you are doing in India during the last five years from preceding that particular prize year it has to be at least five years of the hard work that this 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 is an additional condition for the award now if you look at the question first and second statement looks perfectly fine to you because this award is given by CSIR the age criteria is fine but look at the third statement it said the prize is given for the work done anywhere in the world during the four years preceding it is not the four years if we have just learned the work has to be at least five years preceding, preceding the year of the prize so generally UPSC do not make these kind of changes but yes you always have to be careful especially here in this case with respect to the age with respect to the eligibility criteria and with respect to the work done so sometimes very hardcore technical facts are being asked in the exam well this third statement is wrong eliminating the third one I am going to get only the two statements as the correct one well guys Shanti Swarup is a very famous award and we know it's a science prize well whenever we're talking about the science prizes 90% chances you have some role of the CSIR because that is the top apex uh, body in our country when it comes to industrial scientific researches it is always a CSIR yeah the second one is a bit complicated you may have no idea about the 45 year of the age but you can still take a bit of the chance answer has to be A I would say it's a medium question but still can be risked given given the uh, that you have some idea about this particular award if it if you are totally alien then there is no point attempting it and do take care of the CSIR also one thing I want you to remember since you since I told you that uh, CSIR this is the largest R&D organization of India it is it works under Ministry of Science and Technology as an autonomous body so at least be careful with the ministries are important which particular ministries are involved it is something UPSC always going to trick you on that okay so be very careful 
The next question is again a very hardcore technical uh, question. Now this question is about the gene drive technology. I mean this is not that famous technique. We have heard about genetic engineering, genetic modification. We have we are more familiar with those terms, but this is something even very special. The question also talks about the Wolbachia method. Both uh, the methods has something in common, and that is with respect to how we are going to control the uh, you know all the infectious diseases, the viral diseases which are spread by the mosquitoes. So what exactly this gene drive technology? It has something to do, as the name says. The name says gene drive technology means it has something to do with adding, deleting, disrupting, or modified modifying the genes. That is for sure. The name says it has it is going to do something to the gene of of that particular organism. Well, in in terms of gene drive technology, this technology is very special because. once the genes are going to be manipulated deleted disrupted or modified then these are going to propagate a particular suite of genes throughout the population that is actually going to change the future generations as well of that particular organism the word drive means i am going to make some changes in this generation every generation following that is going to have the same kind of impact that is induced by the gene drive technology well guys in 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 this particular case it is important for you to know that gene drive technology right now it is proposed for so many applications especially when it comes to uh, terminating the mosquitoes especially those mosquitoes which spread the more common disease like dengue malaria zika covid these kind of uh, uh, you know all, all these every time there is a possibility of carrying the infection those mosquitoes will be eliminated even they are they are proposed to be used for invasive species even eliminating the herbicide and the pesticide but how exactly it works how exactly this gene technology gene drive technology works please look at this this gene drive actually means drive by killing just try to remember the word drive by killing because i am because in this method the manipulation of the genes is quickly going to change the whole of the population even the future generations normally you have heard the word as gene modification or genetic engineering right in the case of normal gene modification when i am going to modify the genes of that particular let's say in this case i am going to change the mosquito genes in normal modification normal genetic engineering there is a 50% chance that that particular changed gene is going to transmit uh, it is going to be carried forward in the next generations now if you see the entire graph shows me the normal genetic manipulation i am only going to have very few results of that particular gene that i am i am intended to make the changes right but if i have used the gene drive technology remember the word drive by killing what exactly happens in this gene drive that one chromosome which is which is, which is uh, uh, inserted in the gene it is going to make copy of itself in such a way nearly 100% of that new gene is going to replicate in all the future generations and you can see i am going to have more of my desired results and after like uh, at the third generation stage every particular g every particular organism is going to be that same that i am intended to make that is why it is going to make the changes in the whole of the populations and that is why it is used and proposed to be used for eliminating the mosquitoes now one such thing is called the wolbachia method it's a very famous method you may have a separate question on on this method as well well what happens in the wolbachia 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 is basically guys it's a uh, it is used to control the spread of a viral disease now this is important every time you have to control that viral disease we use the wolbachia method every viral disease especially which is transmitted by the mosquitoes so it has more relevance in case of the mosquito breeding and mosquito generations what exactly we do wolbachia is basically it's a type of bacterium so what we do we introduce that bacteria name wolbachia into the mosquito and since we have introduced that new bacterium to that mosquito that bacterium wolbachia is going to block the viruses into the mosquitoes or or their eggs like for example there is one mosquito which is being infected by any viral disease say 
चिकन गुनिया और डेंगू और जीका वायरस बट बट वेन एवर दैट पर्टिकुलर मॉस्किटो इज गोइंग टू ब्रीड विद नॉर्मल मॉस्किटो इट इज नॉट गोइंग टू ट्रांसफर द इन्फेक्शन इन द फ्यूचर जनरेशन लुक एट लुक एट दिस डायग्राम यू विल अंडरस्टैंड वट एम ट्राइंग टू से इफ यू लुक एट दिस डायग्राम यू हैव दिस यू हैव दिस वन पर्टिकुलर बैक्टीरिया कॉल वॉलबाचिया आई एम गोइंग टू इंट्रोड्यूस इट इन अ मेल मॉस्किटो वेन इट इज गोइंग टू यू नो रिप्रोड्यूस विद अ फीमेल मॉस्किटो it is the their offspring is never ever going to carry the genes of this particular female and every time my wolbachia because these these its genes dominate over the normal viral uh, uh, genes so every time i am going to have that wolbachia series continuing and my mosquitoes are going to eliminate those mosquitoes over a period of time which are the possible carriers of these particular Uh, diseases like malaria uh, zika and dengue and all that right never ever the eggs of the two are going to carry the normal genes wolbachia is a very dominating uh, kind of uh, genetic setup of that bacteria it is always going to subdue subside the uh, you know effect of the normal virus viral genes and that is one way that it it is being said that you know in all the areas which are at high risk of dengue or something like that it is always good that you introduce the wolbachia and the mosquito let them spread in the atmosphere and they are going to breed and they are going to kill the possibility of all those mosquitoes which are going to carry, which are which are possibly can be the carriers of the disease now this is an interesting method it has of course it has something to do with the gene drive technology if you look at the question both statements looks pretty much fine so gene drive technology yes it is about uh, Uh, allowing genes to rapidly spread override the natural selection yes that is the meaning always remember it is gene drive drive is uh, you know it is going to be about killing drive by killing now please understand since the name itself says gene drive technology i think it is very easy for you to even make a guess if it it is gene drive technology of course it is going to do something with the genes it is going to allow the genes to spread and do any kind of thing so this can be guessed well wolbachia is uh, i think it's a it's a typical uh, uh, statement here in this case it is correct yes it's a method of controlling the viral disease transmitted by the mosquitoes yes how exactly it is done i just told you guys now in this particular case i think uh, this question was uh, was a medium question for some people it may be a tough one i would say it's a medium one because these two are very very popular and they are being used in, at certain places that's why they are important i think you can uh, you can attempt it in case you have read it otherwise otherwise normally in in these kind of questions because they are hardcore scientific concepts you can skip because uh, if you have no idea because there there are many methods which are very close to each other there is possibility of getting the things wrong so try to skip if you because there is no point um, attempting these questions with any guess work next question we have question 23 was with respect to the genetic engineering appraisal committee geac now this particular technology is import this particular committee is very important whenever we talk about the genet the release of the genetically engine engineered organisms but if you look at the question of statement number 1 it says this committee is under the ministry of agriculture no i told you 90% times ministries are going to trick you so be careful genetic engineer uh, engineering appraisal committee which is the apex committee uh, which which is uh, responsible for any gm crop that you are going to make any genetically engineer organism product before you release it has to be this geac that is going to give the permission and in, under which ministry it works it works under ministry of environment forest and climate change so first statement is definitely going to go wrong now the second thing was with respect to the glucosinolates and this particular this particular compound is very very famous in the mustard that you and me uses now this mustard is very much in the news for for some reason because in 2022 india has got its first gm variety of the mustard so first statement already we have discussed with respect to the ministry are uh, there is something i want you to know about the glucosinolate we know the mustard oil right so what is the what is the first thing that comes to our mind when we think of the mustard it is very pungent smell uh, you know very particular kind of smell that relates us to uh, the mustard oil and the mustard seeds right 
Why there is that pungent smell uh, which is there? That smell in the mustard is because of the high levels of a compound called, called as glucosinolate. This particular group has sulfur and other nitrogen compounds that makes the oil very very pungent. Now but this is very important you know glucosinolate has many benefits and that is why even mustard seed and mustard oil has many benefits like for example preventing the cancer, detoxing the body, improving the heart health. health. They are also antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties right. That is the reason we have these particular. Now to overcome that problem of the smell in 2022 this genetic engineering appraisal committee has recommended the environmental release of a new genetically modified variety of the mustard that is called DMH. So please be careful you may have a direct MCQ on this also which is which stands for Dhara Mustard Hybrid 11 that is the name of our new genetically modified mustard. Uh, the mustard that is being modified here is is the real name of the mustard is Varuna. The Varuna is a, is a species of mustard that, has, that is being modified here at the DMH. Okay. Now please remember this is India's first GM food crop. So far India has only one which is BT cotton and this is clearly not a food crop. It's a commercial crop. BT cotton is already there since 2002. But as the first GM food crop this is the one we have commercialized so far. In between of course we have got some BT uh, brinjal was there. But it was only for a few years then it was called back because of some protest and there were some uh, doubts with respect to that. So we have discontinued BT brinjal right now. D uh, this mustard is the only GM food crop that we have right now in terms of uh, genetically modified crops. Now this whole process of uh, DMH mustard, the whole process is subjected or regulated by this particular act called the Seed Act 1966. That is important. Now please remember you may have a question with specific question on the agroclimatic conditions of the mustard. Why agroclimatic condition? Because in India, mustards are mainly grown as a rabi crop. Though some mustards are also grown as uh, kharif crop also. But you say 60 to 70 percent, the majority mustard production in India is done in the winter season only. That's why it's a rabi crop. It requires a temperature of 10 to 25 degrees Celsius with a rainfall of say 625 to 1000 millimeter. The soil type is light to heavy, loamy and require frost free conditions. That is why it is, it is mainly uh, you know grown as a rabi crop. It is important and which particular states are the champions of the mustard cultivation. So we have Rajasthan, Haryana, Punjab, Madhya Pradesh and right now this new crop as uh, this new genetically modified mustard that we are talking about. It has actually shown great improvement in terms of yields. Almost 30% higher yield was shown by this new genetic modified variety. Though India is still way behind the global average of the mustard cultivation which is approximately 2000 uh, uh, kg per hectare. India is still far behind. Probably by introducing this new GM mustard we are going to speed up the we are going to cop up with that genetics uh, with that global average right. Now if you look at the question, now first statement is wrong, I already told you the statement is wrong. Now look at the other statement, so the fourth statement says mustard is a Kharif season crop. No, it is grown in some areas in Kharif but mainly mustard is a Rabi crop. It is Rabi and you can, you can relate mustard with wheat also. And now wheat is also Rabi crop so remember, try to remember wheat and mustard together. I think rest of the things you can you, it becomes easy for you to remember. So the two statements are wrong but yeah the second and the third looks perfectly fine. So answer has to be only two. Now this particular question I would say um, yeah this was a medium question because I do not see any problem with the statement number four. Maybe you have this particular question this this was maybe a new thing for you the uh, glucosinolate I think this was a new word for many of you. But this particular genetic appraisal committee is a very common uh, uh, committee and Ministry of Agriculture has nothing to do with in terms of genetic engineering. It is always going to be Ministry of Environment, Forest, Climate Change which is taking care of this genetic uh, uh, you know mo modification in India. If you were not aware then at least you should be aware from now on this is a very important concept. So right answer has to be this and, and this is a question which I think you guys could have attempted easily and or you could have risked uh, uh, a bit also 
because remaining the except the question number statement number two the three are pretty simple and they are very much already in the news so not very difficult question i would say now and and also do do prepare a chart i would suggest do prepare a chart uh, the major rabi and the kharif crops okay do make a chart because you you do not know sometimes these kind of questions can also come which of the following are the rabi crops which of the following are the kharif crops try to you uh, remember them and always do that in into the comparison always make a comparison of the two uh, in a table format becomes easy for you to remember now the next question was with respect to the human embryo model a very very important question the keyword is this particular method which is very much in the news human embryo models what exactly human embryo model means we know about the embryo 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 is something which 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 is being studied um, you know in lot of medical studies these days lot of uh, future human behavior lot of future human diseases are actually going to be predicted by studying the embryo and of course it is always uh, it has a lot of ethical questions involved when you whenever you have to uh, deal with the human embryo i mean normally you cannot kill a baby uh, as an embryo and, and you uh, you know just get it out and study this is totally unethical right so how how and when we are going to study the embryo because um, it has questions to lot of human uh, genes and behaviors and lot of human knowledge can be gathered by studying the embryo so now to solve that ethical problem we got this human embryo model and now human embryos can be grown in the lab this is crazy but it is true now we can grow the embryo in the lab without the egg or the sperm it is simply we are going to use a mix of stem cells stem cells are the they are they are the real treasure of human body stem cells are basically those undifferentiated cells that can develop into any organ of our body and that is why a, a lot of even in uh, today's world we have a culture of stem stem cells bank like we have the blood banks we also have the stem cells banks because it is very precious to uh, to know to to have these uh, cells stored because uh, later on maybe if you need a, a, any organ for your body you need any anything for your body maybe the stem cells can be differentiated and you are going to get your original kind of organ back which has more possibility of giving you better results right and and uh, especially in today's uh, is these days i i have heard that people also keep their umbilical cord umbilical cord uh, has the maximum number of stem cells and the most undifferentiated ones of course there are many varieties of the stem cells we have a totipotent pluripotent monopotent there are a lot of things you can you can study them it's a good it's a good concept i want you guys to study it as a homework it's a good concept but now here uh, only by using the stem cells mix we are we can produce the uh, human embryo in the lab okay and these embryo models are only for the for the purpose of study but do not ever think that these embryo models they cannot be used to get pregnant of course then it will become a big ethical question if i am going to make a baby outside the lab and if i am going to insert that baby by growing it in, into the lab and putting it back to the to the mother's womb it would be a highly disastrous concept because it will give rise to designer babies no and i mean whatever whatever uh, kind of traits i want in my baby i'm going to design it by using that embryo models and then i'm going to get the wife pregnant no that is that is a very unethical concept so clearly the embryo model is only restricted for the study purpose not to not to get any uh, girl pregnant so if you look at the question if you look at the question <coughs> uh, you will you will get the uh, right statement it says uh the human embryo cells it is study the early stages of development yes it is and human embryo can be grown in lab without any sperm or the egg only using the stem cells are used so answer has to be a this question i would say it, it was a medium question but uh, it's not even if if you apply your common sense if you have a basic idea about human embryo you can still think of that it, it, that yes human embryo what else we do with the human embryo it, we are only going to study it for the development of the fetus right that is the only purpose you can think of now the second one is bit tricky i know because uh, you never know uh, that you know which method is using what technology second was a bit star mark a bit question mark but in these cases there are uh, i would say 70% chances the answer is going to be a 70% chances both are going to be a so you can risk it little bit i don't not want to skip it at all 
you could have think it that way okay now question number 25 was with respect to the quantum computing very very important concept in fact it is one of the leading edging edge technologies which are being used today and um, a lot of research is going on on quantum co computing around the world so definitely this is a one topic that everybody should be prepared now quantum computer quantum entanglement phonons phonons is something we have done in test number 1 if you remember now these are two three important concepts so first we learn them and then we get back to, back to the question so what exactly this uh, quantum computer thing is normal computers you think of they work on the binary code they work on bi binary language 0 and 1 you know that is the basic binary code of 0 1 on which entire programming of the computer works but the problem is that at one particular time the any command can be either 0 or can be either 1 there is nothing in between in the normal computers but then comes a possibility that is of the com quantum computer quantum computers are the one they actually study uh, basically quantum mechanic quantum computers are based on quantum mechanics quantum mechanics is that branch of physics that is studying the behavior of the matter of uh, at a atomic and sub atomic level so we are actually utilizing the knowledge and the behavior of the atoms and sub atomic particles and we got to know that there is infinite infinite chances between 0 and 1 the quantum computer does not say as 0 and 1 it says it says uh, it says 0 1 and there are lot lots of intermediate possibilities and that is why that is why these com these quantum computers they are they are utilizing the properties of the atoms and they are able to create super computers super computers because we are going to get you are going to do faster calculation faster processing which was not possible so far so just by utilizing the properties of the atom their behavior how it how the energy flows in in an atom the whole quantum computer works in in that particular situation there are three very important concepts of the quantum computers and these three concepts include the quantum entanglement quantum key distribution and there is one more uh, concept called as superimposition superposition or superimposition both are correct these three concepts are very important what what do you mean by quantum entanglement see the quantum computers like in normal computer you have the bit bit is the basic unit of the storage right bit then you have byte uh, kilobyte gigabyte megabyte right normally but in the uh, quantum computer the basic unit of the storage is called qubit qubit is basically based on the capacity of the atom and the subatomic particles how much they are going to uh, absorb uh, as a as a memory as a storage well in case of quantum quantum entanglement if there are two qubits two qubits are somehow related to each other but by being physically separated this situation in quantum computer called as quantum entanglement okay this actually this particular situation of quantum entanglement is very important because it allows the quantum computer to tackle the complex problems that normal classic computers cannot take and that that makes the quantum computer as super computers similarly you have the quantum key distribution this technology is for the purpose of secure communication method and this is this works as a cryptographic protocol involving the components of the quantum mechanics and they are actually utilized for establishing encrypted communications they are very important part the quantum key distribution and phonons we have discussed in test number 1 also the phonons are basically the particles of the sound energy as the word says phonon it has something to do with phonic phonic is sound right so they are particles of the of the sound energy and uh, they are being used in the quantum computer computers please remember it is it is the phonons which are being used in the in the making of quantum computers why they are used because they can be manipulated to encode the information as a qubit so qubit has a relation to the phonon and that is going to be the basic unit of information like like we have normally we have the bit it's the qubit for for the purpose of quantum computer now if you look at the question the first statement you will find as absolute correct without any problem but look at the second statement what what is wrong with the second statement it says 
quantum entanglement is about the secure communication was that no it was the quantum key distribution no it was it was it was the second technology the quantum key distribution look at that quantum key distribution was with respect to secure uh, secure communication quantum en entanglement was with respect to the qubits being separated and still interlinked with each other so second statement is wrong and whenever you think of the quantum computer uh, always remember these three concepts superimposition quantum entanglement and quantum key distribution this is wrong and by simply eliminating it i am going to remain with my two options which i can still risk the second, uh, the third statement looks pretty much okay because I know the phonons are the sound energy and they have a possibility to be used as quantum computer. At least I can take that much risk. So I, I would take a risk uh, into that. It was a tough one, but still I would take a risk because I have the option of eliminating. At least in such, a, such cases where you are being given, the statements are being given, you can still eliminate. So my answer has to be one and three. That is going to be the right answer, one and three. Okay, so yeah, the third second statement has a problem inside. Now, if you look at if you go with the question number 26, very important question, again has to do something with the technology. Now the question was with respect to the Majorana fermions. Okay, let us say I have no idea, no clue about it. This looks very tough for me. But please look and read the options. It says this term, the Majorana fermions, relates to what? You know, at least you know that the fermions are nothing but the subatomic particles. It is, it, it's a term that we use for subatomic particles. Now, it, if it is about the subatomic particles, do you think subatomic particles are going to be used for wireless communication technologies or visible light communication technology? Because that is what you call as Li-Fi. Wireless communication we have as a Wi-Fi. So clearly these two are not going to be utilizing the fermions. Maybe cloud services but so far the cloud services are also not utilizing the subatomic particles so the right answer that i can think of by eliminating the three it has to be quantum computing because we have just learned the quantum computing is all based on the science on the on the on studies of atomic and subatomic particles so fermions has also relation with the quantum computing very very important so answer so this question it was a tough one, I agree, but I can still attempt it by eliminating. Look at the logical senses. The communication technology so far, because they are already there, but they are not using the fermions, right? So if you read about the fermions, just to give you a little bit information about the fermions, all subatomic particles, it's a collective term. All Fermions is nothing but all subatomic particles that make up the matter. They are called the fermions. Every particle, every subatomic particle has its own antiparticle. What is an antiparticle, guys? So let's say this is one uh, semi, this is one um, uh, subatomic particle, and it has it has a positive charge. By default, subatomic charge uh, uh, there would be another subatomic particle having the same mass as this normal subparticle, but it is going to have opposite physical charge and opposite magnetic charge. So every particle has a sub uh, antiparticle of it. And what happens? Just think about it. When positive and negative are going to strike, they are going to get eliminated. And that's exactly what happens. Whenever a particle and its antiparticle meet, they annihilate each other. But there is something special with respect to the Majorana fermions. Why they are special? Because they are topologically protected. Means they, are, they bind together to form a single particle means when two Majorana fermions whenever they strike to each other they are not easily get destroyed they are not destroyed by any noise or errors and that is why because they are they are a bit more stable that is why they are used to create topological quantum computers we use them in quantum computer because they are not easily being destroyed. Normally, the quantum computer has a problem with the noises. Every quantum computer is very, very fragile to noise and the error. But these fermions are special subatomic particles, not destroyed by noise and error. And that's why we use them in quantum computers. I hope that makes sense to everyone. If that does, the next question we have is with respect to the monoclonal antibody. Now you are supposed to figure out what statements are correct. Okay. Now what is a monoclonal antibody? If you if you learn this method, 
if you have any idea about monoclonal uh, antibody the question can be solved easily first of all you know what the antibodies right you know what is the normal meaning of antibodies like our body has an immune system and antibodies are like the soldiers of our body antibodies are the they are soldiers of our immune system right any any disease that tries to enter in our body the antibodies get into work and they work as a soldier they defend us from any infection or any pathogen or antigen that comes to our body that is the main function of antibodies now here the word is monoclonal antibodies now monoclonal uh, clonal is also look at the two short forms remember the short forms also you may have a question on short forms so monoclonal antibodies are basically the proteins they are the proteins they are antibodies but these proteins are made in laboratories normal antibody we develop in our body on its own after we encounter any infection our body develops antibodies on its own but here the monoclonal why they are called monoclonal because they are created in laboratories and they are created as clones they are exact copies of our antibodies and then they are put directly into the body normally what happens and this is this relates to our second uh, statement also normally how the body immunity works so whenever we are exposed to any antigen antigen any infection any virus bacteria whenever we get exposed to any antigens our body kick starts the response and that kick start the response is when it the, our body itself start producing the antibodies antibodies are produced always in the host body like my body and this type of immunity that we get after the antibodies gets triggered out that was after the infection of the antigen that is called active immunity it it, it is a slow process it takes time like normally whenever you get vaccinated like for example recently we all got vaccinated for the covid vaccine so what happens in the covid vaccine in the covid vaccine that uh, uh, you know that little little bit of that spike protein of the covid was injected into us into our body be it covid shield or covaxin whatever vaccine it was actually the antigen was put inside our body and then we got the fever right then we got the fever and then the antibodies were developed in our body and over a period of time we got immune that is that this particular process is called the active immunity but then we have the other concept as passive immunity which are like ready made antibodies just like we have discussed about the monoclonal in monoclonal antibodies the antibodies are copied they are made in the laboratories and directly not the antigen directly antibodies are going to insert in your body like a ready made products right that is what the monoclonal and that is why monoclonal always give you a passive immunity because they are not making your body made the antibodies they are making it for you directly in, into the laboratory so if you look at the question the first statement looks correct monoclonal are the uh, antibodies they are made in laboratories that is fine but look at the second one the ready made antibodies are they called active no the ready made like monoclonal they are called the passive immunity okay this is important so first statement is correct second is not i i would say um i would say this was a medium one but still can be attempted because look at this look at this the word monoclonal antibody itself says it's a laboratory made product and anything which is ready made cannot be called as active active is something because immunity antibodies is a very basic concept that we all know right so that can be done easily the next question is again a science a science based question and this question was with respect to dna replication and the rna vex, uh, vex, uh, virus replication what you should be aware of the rna dna very important guys you know about the viruses right viruses are called the semi dead or semi partial alive organisms why because whenever virus still it is outside the host cell it is almost dead but as the virus enters into its host cell it becomes active becomes alive starts replicating itself so virus always self replicate itself in the host cell when i use the word self replicate that means a virus is capable of producing thousands of the new copies of the original virus and that to at an extraordinary rate now any virus can be made by two type of genetic material it can be a dna based virus or can be rna based virus if the genetic material of the virus is dna then it would be called dna virus and it is going to be double stranded because you know the dna itself 
is a double stranded structure like something like that uh, something of this sort if you let this okay so this is a double stranded structure like this and it's it is called as a double stranded dna virus if the genetic material is rna which then it is called uh, rna virus and it is going to be single stranded out of the two because rna is single stranded rna mutation is always going to be higher because there is less resistant and rna being single stranded virus is going to replicate at a very extraordinary at a faster rate we have just seen and that was one of the reasons why covid was so deadly because the covid 19 the sars cov 2 the virus was actually an rna virus that is why it was capable of replicating itself at, at a tremendous speed okay even the hiv the any influenza virus hiv all of them are rna viruses and and rna viruses are always going to spread at a very disastrous speed dna replication in comparison is a bit slow why because the dna replication happens in the nucleus of the cell like you can see here this is the nucleus of this particular cell rna replication does not need to take place at the dna at the nucleus rna replication take place in the cytoplasm what is the cytoplasm cytoplasm you can see is this particular liquid kind of gel this liquid which is available um, inside the cell that is called cytoplasm okay and this particular in this cytoplasm the rna replication takes place that is why rna replication is faster much more much more at a greater speed and dna viruses are always stable being stable they are not going to replicate at that faster speed but rna viruses are always unstable and that is why they replicate at a very very higher speed and obviously something that replicates at a very higher speed you can think of, uh, very logically if rna mutation rate is higher it is always going to give you more high genetic diversity because of its replication rate isn't it now this this statement this question is important and that's why you are supposed to learn about it now if you look at the question guys now you have the question which says the dna replication take place in the nucleus yes that's why it is slow it is comparatively less and rna replication take place in cytoplasm obviously that's why it is higher it is more RNA viruses have high mutation rate, yes, that's why it has high genetic diversity and can replicate, uh, rapidly replicate, yeah. So, I think this was a very simple question, something that you all have read in class 11th uh, uh, biology, it was a very straightforward question and, um, uh, and second statement make more sense because RNA virus is something we have just dealt with as a COVID and it was everywhere in the newspaper that it's a replication rate and we have seen the way covid was spreading has to be uh, at a higher speed the next question 29 was with respect to the lego india laboratories now what is lego india it has some relation to the gravitational waves both concepts are very very important so what why it was in news recently because in maharashtra's hingoli lego india observatory was recently passed it is going to be set up soon and LIGO India in Maharashtra is going to be the third node of this original LIGO laboratory which is a project of United States of America. You, thus LIGO India in Maharashtra is going to start its operation somewhere around 2030 and it is expected to have a lifespan of 30 years. But why this LIGO is so important? Why? What are these LIGO laboratories? See LIGO, look at the word G. G is basically for the gravitational waves. LIGO India the third node in the LIGO observatories is going to be one more, the third in the gravitational wave observatories. We already have this gravitational wave observatory in Italy, in Virgo, in Japan at Kagra. You may have this, this uh, you know, these things as match the following also. So be aware of the, of the words because UPSC asked the question places in news. So Virgo, Kagra, Hingoli, why they are in the news? Because of the LIGO observatories. And they are all going to study and they are all going to detect. They are trying to detect the gravitational waves. Now, what exactly exactly the gravitational waves are? This, this idea, this whole concept of gravitational waves was first predicted by Albert Einstein in his very famous general theory of relativity. There he predicted that there has to be something called as gravitational waves. And look at the beauty. 
This theory was proposed way back in 1915, right? And we are searching for gravitational waves right now in 2024. This man predicted way more than 100 years back, and we are still finding those gravitational waves. They are very weak, very very weak and faded waves, but they exist in our uh, in in our uh, uh, you know space time framework. Now, very interestingly, talking about the gravitational waves. These these gravitational waves are very very similar. They are very much like ripples in the fabric of the space time. And any time there is any violent or energetic process that happens in the universe, these ripples are created. For example, while the black holes are being created or the black holes are going to crash into each other, any violent energetic process can give give rise to these ripples. in the form of gravitational waves gravitational waves are very very similar to the sound waves sound waves also need a medium to uh, travel right gravitational waves also need a wave a medium to travel but for gravitational waves the medium is space time itself it's a fabric of the space time through which the gravitational waves and that is why it is very difficult to detect them and for detecting them right now we have these so called ligo projects it's a very important uh, concept everything is related everything is important uh, now looking at looking at the question the first statement looks pretty much correct yes we have got maharashtra hingoli we got the ligo india project existence predicted by albert einstein in his theory of relativity very important theory do read read about it it's a must read theory guys something that we all should be aware of and we all should be proud of that we have got so many things from this theory that was predicted way back in 100 uh, years back right and the third statement says gravitational or distortion in the space fabric caused by movements of the massive objects yes uh, in the ripple made so third statement is also correct answer has to be d i think this was a <coughs> this was a very simple straight forward question we all know about this theory we all know about the gravitational waves uh, it was a medium one but something that you can risk for sure because clearly there is nothing to eliminate but be careful about the place now you know it is maharashtra hingoli they may confuse you by saying okay in ladakh we have got recently the ligo observatory because in ladakh we have got many laboratories not the ligo one but ladakh was also news for the space projects so be careful about the place that is uh, something you have to be taking care of right the question number 30 that we had was with respect to the very interesting concept of intellectual property rights i am sure we all have heard these terms copyright trademark or geology, uh, the geographical indication the gi tags right we all have heard about them yes or no so what exactly these are and they are all called as uh, uh, the intellectual property rights so we'll need to learn little bit then we'll come back and try to solve this particular question what went wrong so if you have heard of this word intellectual property rights you know uh, intell like normally if let's say you buy a property you buy a plot you buy you buy a flat so basically whenever whenever you are purchasing anything it becomes yours right your farm your flat your plot your house is your property but that's a physical property it's a materialistic property when you create something from your mind you create any invention you know any artistic work any literary work any design or symbol any image or anything that you created from the power of your brain your mind well that is called as intellectual property right like for example very simply you you are you are seeing this particular um, image it says copyright copyright at uh, pmf is this whole picture this whole uh, uh, you know this slide was prepared by pmf is team and they have this copyright nobody can use this without their permission so to so as to protect the innovation artistic work designs and symbols we we are using the intellectual property rights the idea the very first time we thought of protecting these kind of things it relates to the paris convention now conventions are important so we got the paris convention first time it was 1883 paris convention for protection of industrial properties and then later on in 1886 we got a burn convention so if by chance you have this mcq that okay these two conventions relates to what so these two conventions relates to intellectual property rights intellectual property rights actually give a right 
through patent, copyright and trademarks that we will learn. Why it is so important? Of course, if I am creating something, if I am creating my poetry, if I am creating my artistic work, my painting, if I am creating something, uh, for example, I am creating this video, I don't want anybody else to use it or misuse it without, without my permission, right? So we need the IPRI, uh, we need these IR, uh, IPR rights for encouraging innovation, growth, for safeguarding the rights of the creators, also ensuring the ease of doing business and facilitate the transfer of technologies. We need these kind of protections. How exactly these IPR works? The intellectual property rights are divided into two broad domains. One, we have the copyright, as you can see, it, this slide also says at the right copyright pmfis.com and then we have some industrial uh, properties this is more for private use copyright is mainly for the private use for for the for the sake of uh, uh, you know for uh, in protecting the interest of one particular company or one particular person but then we have industrial property rights also industrial property rights can be trademark can be gi under the uh, distinctive signs that we use Industrial property rights also include the patents, the industrial designs, the trade secrets. Like for example, we have the KFC chicken, right? And it said it, it said that it is made by secret spices. That is the, that is their trade secret. That is their recipe secret. Simply, we whenever we innovate any product, we always go for the patent. For any technology that we create, we always go for the patent of the technology. Any trademark, any sign that we have the trademarks, no? Like any, uh, like normally what artists used to do, they used to sign under their work. That was their trademark. Any symbol, any sign was used as to make sure this is the work of this particular person or this particular company. And then we have geographical indication tag, GI tags. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about them in, in a bit of detail because our question has the three to discuss broadly. So remember the trademark is nothing but a sign uh, that is being done to make sure the product belongs to that particular person. Every trademark is governed under the Trademark Act 1999. Copyright is more of a legal term which uh, describes the rights that creators have on their literary and the artistic works. So mainly for literary artistic works we have the copyright as we have seen in the picture, right? And this was all guaranteed by the Copy Copyright Act 1957. Then we have this geographical indication tag, the GI tag that we have. GI is, uh, as the name says, geographical indication. It's a legal recognition primarily given to agriculture, natural or manufactured products originating from a definite geographical territory. For example, I say, okay, sir, uh, I want to have the best tea in India. And I say, well, sir, which tea? I would say, oh, I'm going, I, I love to have a Darjeeling tea. Darjeeling tea gives me that authentic feeling. Okay, this, has, this is going to be the best tea of India. Basically, the whenever we use that geographical territory, there is a that this product is purchased or this product has originated in a very definite geographical territory that gives the assurity of its quality, that gives the assurity of its distinctiveness as a product, right? And no other person can misuse that same name, that particular tag, nobody else can use it. And that's why to maintain that authenticity, the GI tags are given for agricultural manufactured products. It can be given to handicrafts, can be given to industrial goods also. And for that, we have this GI Act 1999. Now, if you look at the look at the question, what question was asking, if you look at the question, it says the first and second are wrong. Why? Because they have interchanged the word. What is a copyright? It's a legal term. It's a legal term used for protecting the literary artistic works. And trademark is a sign capable of distinguishing uh, the work of one person from the other. Right? So first and second are wrong. They're inter-exchange. Third is correct. I would say this was a medium one, but something you can attempt because trademark, copyright, they're very, very normal things. And copyright is something that you normally see in any of the PDF and study materials. They always put a copyright on that. So answer has to be only one, the third one, which is there. Now, having said so, I want you guys to look at the list. Now, uh, in the last 12 months, at least in the last 12 months, whatever important GI tags are given and for which particular product. And whenever you talk about GI product, always remember the name of the product along with the state that it belongs because state or the place is very important. At least for the last 12 months, do uh, read about those GI tags because they are very, very important for you. Okay. Now, moving ahead, guys, talking about the next question that was... That was our question number uh, 
okay that was our question number 31 the question 31 was with respect to the aditya l1 this is a very special mission that india has recently launched the name aditya make us understand that it has something to do with the sun the name aditya belongs to sun right so basically aditya l1 now what is this l1 is something i am going to discuss little later aditya l1 is india's first solar mission launched by isro and that was launched by using the pslv the polar satellite launch vehicles are used basically for the light uh, light and intermediate or light or medium payloads whenever we have a heavy payload for the satellite we always go for gslv the geosynchronous vehicles that that are big uh, you know gslv we have used in case of chandrayaan 3 that is important now why we have sent a mission to the uh, to the sun well aditya annual is always going to discuss uh, it is going to study the uh, solar atmosphere it is going to discuss it is going to study the corona chromosphere photosphere these are the three layers of the sun and it is going to examine all the phenomena that relates to the solar emissions including the solar wind flare the coronal mass ejections these coronal mass ejections are responsible uh, for uh, disrupting the radio communication on earth it also disrupts some electrical setups they are also responsible for for the auroras that we get uh, to see on the north and south pole right so everything about the sun is going to be studied by aditya l1 now what is this l1 l1 is important now you please understand this concept what happens whenever whenever there are two bodies now this uh, uh, aditya l1 is about the earth and the sun now what happens guys anytime the two celestial bodies they interact with each other they have certain gravitational and centrifugal forces to exchange isro has launched the aditya l1 l1 here stands for the lagrarian point what is a lagrarian point see as you can see on the picture look at this every time every two bodies whenever they interact here this is your sun this is your earth okay any time the two bodies are going to interact every body two bodies are going to have few lagrarian points there are five most commonly there are five lagrarian points what is a lagrange point by the way it is this particular point all these l1 l2 l3 l4 l5 all these points are basically those points where the gravitational forces between the two large bodies the sun and the earth here the gravitational forces of the two bodies are going to balance the centrifugal force which are going to be experienced by smaller objects satellite in this case it is the aditya in this case now the when the gravitational forces of the two large bodies are going to balance the centrifugal force for the for the for the smaller body it actually allows the satellite to remain in that position for a longer time it's it's a kind of fixing that position and you do not need to have extra fuel there is also fuel saving and you are going to stay in one position for a longer time that gives you better chance of you know fulfilling your mission every every two bodies have these five lagrarian points when it comes to aditya l1 now you know what is l1 so this is this point l1 where we have established our aditya l1 and these point and these uh, uh, orbits are called the halo orbit or the halo orbit the name is the halo orbit right that is important isro has become the third space agency after nasa and european space agency to place an observatory at this l1 point before india we have got two into the picture but it's a proud moment for india that we have become the third one now look at the statements look at the third statement about aditya l1 was isro the first agency to put any observatory at l1 no we have just said it's the third nasa european space has already done it so third you need to eliminate aditya l1 spacecraft is inserted at the halo orbit at leg region l1 it says l1 i think this is very easy to guess now please understand why third is also likely to be there because uh, uh, we have we have read about the leg region missions of nasa and european space union uh, na? so this 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 uh, is uh, wrong the first statement aditya l1 it says india's first solar mission was launched by isro using the gslv was that gslv 
Aditya L1 was launched with by using the PSLV because it's not that heavy mission. It's a light medium kind of mission. So clearly the third first one is also wrong. Uh, the only answer we have is the only one that is the second statement is correct. I think I, I would say uh, this was a medium one. You can risk it. It is something you can figure out because there is no problem. Uh, leg radian point is very important topics and uh, you expect a question on that. You may have a question on leg radian points as well. Okay. Next question we have is with respect to Navik. We have done Navik so many times. Now it says, now this, this can be done very straightforward. It says Navik is IRNS Indian Regional Navigation System. Yes, it is. It is independent. It's a standalone navigation developed by ISRO. Yes, it is. So this first statement looks correct. Look at the second statement. It says the Navik. Now you know the Navik has seven satellites. We have discussed it already. Navik is the constellation of seven. Navik stands for navigation with Indian constellation. It is, it is just the Indian version of GPS. It's the Indian alternative of GPS, I would say. So it has seven satellites, yes, but the three satellites are not geosynchronous. It out of the seven satellite it has, the three satellites are geostationary and four satellites are geosynchronous. What is a geostationary orbit? You have this earth over the equator. I have this geostationary orbit. Geosynchronous is my this orbit. It is this orbit. A bit tilted across the equator, a bit tilted is called geosynchronous, right? So four satellite, uh, sorry, three satellites as, uh, oh, sorry, four, four satellites as geosynchronous, right? And three satellites as geostationary. That is how the, the uh, Navik works. So this statement is wrong. Then the, look at the third statement. It says at present, there are five global navigation systems including India's. Is India's Navik a global navigation system? The name itself says regional navigation. This is a hint. Is my Navik a global one? No, it's a regional one because it covers only India and 1500 kilometer around India. It's a regional navigation. It is never a, a global navigation. Only four global navigations are there, including GPS, GLONASS of uh, Russia, Bidu of China and Galileo by European Union. India is still a regional navigation system. It may become uh, uh, global tomorrow, but today it is not, right? And to become a global one, it, India has to operate at middle earth orbit as well, medium earth orbit as well. But right now it is not operating at middle, medium earth orbit. So second and thirds are wrong. Fourth statement is correct. Navik has two type of services. We have the standard positioning services, which is available for all the civilians. And then we have encrypted services for our defense forces. So yeah, so that makes sense. So right now, the uh, I think this was a very medium kind of question, but something I can attempt. Attempt because Navik is very famous. We have discussed it so many times, okay? So this question has to have the right answer as two. First and fourth being correct. Second, third are wrong. Regional, navigational and global is something you have to be careful about, okay? Okay, now uh, this is the picture I told you already. This is geostationary, exactly over the equator and uh, geostationary means, you know, it has, it has, uh, the it synchronizes, uh, uh, you know, it falls in the same category uh, on, a, on a very same line as equator. Geosynchronous is, uh, the only difference is the tilt. The only difference is the tilt of the orbit. If it is a tilted orbit, it is geosynchronous. It is uh, straight over the equator. It is geostationary. Question number 33 was with respect to the culture. It says during the G20 summit and do expect a lot of questions from G20 because India hosted G20 this time. So a lot of questions are expected to come on G20. It says during the G20 summit at the Bharat Mandapam, a cultural corridor was showcased at the art culture heritage by all G20 nations. What India has contributed in that? Very factual. No scope, nothing, no scope of any guesswork. Answer is B. Panini Ashtadihai. I would say this was a for this was an easy one if you have read it. If you have not aware of this, this was a tough one, something to skip, because technically anything can be there. All are very, all are big marvels of Indian culture. Anything India could have contributed, no? So, but the right answer here is Panani Ashtadhyayi. 
basically this time g20 was set up in india india was the venue um, g20 this particular word this cultural corridor was called as bharat mandapam why this name bharat mandapam because you you must have heard about karnataka's very famous lord bhaswaswara and uh, he gave this idea of public ceremony to be conducted as bharat mandapam in his idea of anubhav mandam mandapam An anubhav mandapam was basically a kind of society where everyone was supposed to be happy now bharat mandapam uh, this was the cultural corridor india what india contributed was this panini ashtadhyayi basically you know about the great panini he was the greatest grammarian of sanskrit language he gave us the sanskrit language and its grammar so panini wrote this book called ashtadhyayi and this book was written somewhere around 6th century bc and that was a work on sanskrit grammar considered to be the best so far that we have so that is the answer as panani ashtadhyayi question number 34 was with respect to the hosal architecture very important architecture one of the finest architecture that you are going to have in indian uh, art and culture hosal architecture was developed under the hosal no press for guessing yes it was belong to karnataka but what about the centuries in history especially the art and culture it is very very important for you to keep a track of the centuries hoysal kingdom was not there at 7th 7th century so technically how hoysal architecture could have been there at 7th century that is not the right one so first statement is wrong so to before i give you the right answer just have a look at what you have to prepare about the hoysal why it was in news why uh, the hoysal architecture was in news because the three very famous temples of hoysal in belur helibid and uh, somnathpura in karnataka the these temples they are considered to be the sacred uh, ensembles of hoysal they were finalized as india's nomination for consideration of the unesco world heritage list to to add on to this recently india has added uh, the marathas mighty forts into the heritage list so do read about that also now coming to the question hoysal architecture was somewhere around the 10th and the 14th century it was not the 7th century as it was given to you in the question hoysal architecture is important they are influenced by western chalukya architecture and they are considered to be the best part of karnataka dravid tradition when it comes to the temple architecture of the deccan hoysal architecture has a has has a bigger name to discuss and these temples are known and famous for the kind of detailed carvings they do on the soap stones they are also famous for some kind of plan that they used to construct the temple what they use they have a distinctive star shaped plan which is also called as the st the uh, stellate plan every time they have to construct a temple they are going to use this kind of star plan a star shaped plan where you have multiple shrines around this one particular central hall they are going to be multiple shrines that is that is their uh, so whenever you think of the hoysal always think of the star shape and the stellate plan that is important they are going to be ask you this and the hoysal temples they have the sculptures of deities and the mythological scenes animals dancers bird everything but the sculptures of the hoysal temple they reflect multiple religious diversities they have they have the philosophies and religious diversities belonging to hindu jain and buddhist themes so clearly you have them as very secular as a very secular kind of sculptures representing the three bigger religions of that particular time right so now if you look at the question if you look at the question so first statement clearly wrong there is problem with the with the century it is not this it is 10 to 14th century other than that second and third are correct the stellate plan the star shape belongs to hoysal and sculptures are secular they they include the themes of the three religions so right answer has to be b uh, i would say this question was a medium one hoysal architecture is very famous and uh, you cannot you cannot guess the history if you have not read it so if you have no idea absolutely then you you should skip because art and culture questions you have to be very sure because art and culture you really cannot do any guess work if it is there if it is there then there is nothing you can do out right okay so moving to the next question question 35 question 35 was with respect to the fanigiri artifacts 
Now this was also in the news, the Fanigiri artifacts, let me tell you, it belongs to the Buddhism. What exactly was Fanigiri artifact? Now this particular question, I would say it was a tough one uh, because it's a very straightforward question. And those people who are not aware, it becomes really difficult to do any guesswork. It can be anything. It can be anything, any religion, right? So you should skip if you have absolutely no idea. What exactly this Fanigiri Buddhist archite artifacts are? Basically, uh, these artifacts, they are set of archaeological findings that belongs to a Buddhist site in Telangana and that's why they are Buddhist artifacts. They discovered way back in 1942, they belong to somewhere 200, to 4, 2000 BC, 200 BC to 400 CE, that is the tentative timeline when they were actually created. And look at this, look at this beautiful, uh, this particular beautiful, uh, uh, you know, decoration this uh, thorana thoranas are discovered at the fanigiri so look at this these are the artifacts we are talking about here very very special thing about this thorana is it has the images of mahayan and hinayan the two very important schools of buddhism mahayan called the greater wheel and hinayan called the lesser wheel lesser wheel people they worship buddha in the form of symbols the mahayan buddhist uh, worship buddha in in, in the in, in a form in a uh, you know person like form in form of its pictures right the two are very contrasting schools mahayan muhinyan but here in the fanigiri artifacts you have the images of both it actually suggests that there was a time when the two schools coexisted and yes they did we know that right so please be aware the fani the fanigiri buddhist artifacts belongs to the state of telangana states are very important because uh, you may have a direct question with respect to the state in the in terms of uh, you know uh, match the following or something next question is actually the match the following it says you have the heritage unesco heritage site and the location now i think all the three are very famous konak temple it is not andhra you know about the konak sun temple it's one of the very famous sun temple of india that belongs to the state of odisha right shantiniketan as the name says, it has its belonging to the Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore belongs to West Bengal. It's a city. It's, uh, Shantiniketan is a city that was established by Rabindranath Tagore in West Bengal. So this is correct. But the first one is wrong. Brihadeshwara Temple, Chola Architecture. We just have got the two very in important movies, the Pony Selvan 1 and Pony Selvan 2. Brihadeshwara is not Karnataka. Brihadeshwara is Tamil Nadu. It relates to the mighty Chola Empire. So here in this case, only one pair is correct. One pair, it was a medium one, but something you can attempt because I do not see any problem with the three. All three are very, very famous, right? It's not something, uh, something very tough or deep that they have asked you. It was a very straightforward kind of question. Talking about the uh, Konak temple, it was built somewhere around 13th century. And uh, this was uh, made by, this was created by King Narsim Dev I who belong to the Eastern Ganga dynasty. It, it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It got its tag way back in 1984. And um, every year, thousands and thousands of uh, Hindus, they gather at this particular place of Konak Sun Temple for the Chandra Bhag Mela that happens every year here in the month of February, right? Now, Konak Temple, Sun Temple is called as Black Pagoda. And very interestingly, in, in uh, Odisha only, uh, we have the Jagannath temple in, in Puri that is called as White Pagoda. So, Sun temple as black and in the same city you have the White Pagoda as Jagannath temple also. So, temple architecture is important and let me tell you, any temple architecture of Eastern India, like specifically of uh, Odisha, it becomes important because uh, you have a lot of questions coming from the temples of Odisha uh, in the last couple of years. Question number two, I told you about Shantini Ketan. Yes, it is also World Heritage Site. It's a, it's a town located in West Bengal's Birhum district, right? And uh, Brideshwar, I told you, it, it is dedicated to Lord Shiva. Uh, belongs to Tamil Nadu, Tanjor. Tanjor is very famous, very, very famous. That was the capital of the mighty Chola Empire. And this Brideshwar temple is an example of the great Dravidian architecture that we have we have got there. Bre Deswara specifically was uh, built by Raja Raj Chola 1 and um, this is this is a part of great living Chola temples uh, we, we call. Other than Bre Deswara, the living Chola temples include Gangai Konda Cholapuram and the Era Vatsivara temple as well. So these three 
together are, are called the living Chola temples. Question number 37 was with respect to the lithium. Very important topic of lithium because lithium is in news uh, for, the, for quite a long time. And it was in news recently because in India we have got two important reserves of the lithium. If you are following the current affairs, you know we have got lithium reserves recently in news, especially in the Jammu and Kashmir. And some of them we got in Rajasthan as well. So this statement is absolutely wrong because you can straight away eliminate it because we have recently discovered this is called as white gold. Lithium is considered to be white gold these days because it is so much in demand because it is used in the rechargeable batteries. You all have heard about the lithium ion batteries. No, lithium ion battery is probably the most famous battery that is being used in the world. So yes, it is true, but the third statement is wrong. First statement is also correct because it says lithium has the lowest density of the all metal. Yes, of all the solid metals, it, is, it has the lowest density. That makes it actually favorable for uh, using it in the rechargeable batteries. That lowest density is a favorable condition for making the rechargeable batteries. Okay, first and second has a connection. So here the answer has to be only two. I would say it, it was a medium one, but something that you can attempt because, because this topic is very, very important and famous already in news and we are using it. Talking about the lithium a little more, please remember a few facts about the lithium. Lithium is actually non-ferrous. It's a white alkali metal because it is an alkali metal. It is highly reactive. Like any other alkali metal, it is highly reactive. It is flammable, catches fire very, very uh, soon. That's why lithium is always stored in either in a vacuum or it is stored in an, it is an inert liquid. Mainly we use kerosene or mineral oil to store uh, the lithium. Lithium never occurs freely in nature. It is always, it, it is always there in the pegmatitic mineral. Pegma pegmatitic minerals are those which are found in layers, you know, more than one form. It is found in layers with other minerals. That is called pegmatitic. So it never occurs. It cannot occur in natural freely because being highly reactive and highly flammable. Uh, second and third are correct. I told you it is called the white gold. And with respect to India, please be aware in India, we have lots of reserves, po possible potential sites in Rajasthan, Bihar, Andhra, Chhattisgarh, Gujarat. But recently, we, we have actually discovered lithium reserves in Karnataka's Mandya and Jammu Kashmir Riyasi districts. These two we have already discovered. When it comes to the global top producers in the world, it is Australia in the world producing the lithium at the largest scale, followed by Chile, China, Argentina, Zimbabwe. When, when you talk about the lithium, also talk about the lithium triangle. In South America, you have the three countries. You have Chile, you have the country Chile, you have the country Bolivia, and then you have the country Argentina. These three countries are called lithium triangle. And India has recently signed a lot of agreement with Chile because India is going to procure lithium at, at, in a very heavy amount. So we have got a lot of... Uh, Treaty signed with Chile for the exchange of the lithium reserves. And lithium is classified as one of the critical minerals in India. It is a critical mineral because, um, um, uh, because we, we are largely dependent on the imports. That is why it is one of the critical minerals in our list. There are, there are approximately 30 minerals, 30-31 which are the critical minerals in India. The next question that we have is with respect to the Adi Shankaracharya. Now, what this question is about? Well, with respect, with reference to Adi Shankaracharya, uh, you are supposed to get some statements. So, first, you you must know about Adi Shankaracharya, very tall, prominent figure in terms of India's philosophy. Uh, Adi Shankaracharya, uh, he he was an ancient Indian uh, philosopher. He was a theologian uh, who was there in India in somewhere eighth century, and uh, he is he is considered the father of Indian philosophy as well. He was born in Kerala. The major philosophical contribution that was given by Adi Shankaracharya was that his, he gave a concept called as Advait Vedanta, which is also called as non-dualistic school of Hindu philosophy. Non-dualistic school says that this whole world, the world around us is nothing but a Maya. It is an illusion. The materialistic world is nothing but a Maya. And there is only one reality, only in one reality, and that is Brahm. That is the God, Supreme is the only reality. That is called non-dualistic school. Only one thing is real and that is Brahma. 
okay that is advait vedanta and he was the one who uh, who set up the school of advait vedanta and also he gave us the shan manta shan manta is basically six subsects which are which which is nothing but sig sig signifying the worship of the six supreme deities so he his contribution and adi shankara was the one who established the four mat in our country uh, in west east north and south so we have got the four mat mat the largest uh, uh, you know holy place for any sanatan dharam follower and it was in news recently because recently uh, the the heads of those four mat they decided not to be a part of uh, uh, ayodhya temple uh, you know uh, inauguration so it was in news and it has a relation to adi shankaracharya so something you should be aware of uh, when it when you talk about adi shankaracharya uh, he authored almost 18 commentaries he wrote on major religious scriptures and he wrote his commentary on brahma sutra as well his commentary on brahma sutra is known as brahma sutra bhas and this is considered to be the oldest surviving commentary on any subject in india this is important he established a dashnami sampraday he also has a credit of establishing dashnami sampraday that is advocating a monastic way of life despite his reference for ancient hinduism he still criticizes mimamsa school of hinduism that only talks about ritual practices because his idea was a bit more practical his idea was bit more realistic not something based on pure uh, you know uh, the practices it was more of the action kind of stuff so first statement is correct second is correct and third is also correct so i have the answer as c adi shankar this this particular question was a bit tough one if you have no idea at least if you are aware of the two of the three statement you can still risk it but if you have no idea then because it's a hardcore topic of history there is no clue nothing but let me tell you please do read about all these schools of philosophy advait vedanta uh, you have other schools also you have the non dualism then you have the uh, vishesh advait there are lot of lots of concept so please do read read about these concept of philosophy there's always chances of you getting a question on these kind of topics very very typical questions the next question is from the modern india it talks about the hindustan republican association which is called hra one of the one of the very important uh, association when it comes to the extremism or the or the extremist activities that were taking place or the revolutionary activities that were taking place in india at in that particular time well if you talk about the hindustan republic association remember this hra was actually founded in 1924 hra was started by ram prasad bismil sachin sanyal and jogesh chandra chatterjee these three organize their armed revolution to overthrow the british government bhagat singh was a member of hindustan socialist republican association which hra was renamed by chandrashekhar azad in 1928 it was chandrashekhar azad who renamed hra by and it renamed as hindustan socialist the word socialist was added because that time the idealism of those revolutionaries was more inspired by the socialist activities so that's why hra become hsra and bhagat singh became a member at that time when hra was in hsra but it was under the leadership of chandrashekhar azad he has to be given the credit of renaming it the kakori famous kakori train robbery train conspiracy that uh, that was that was carried out by ram prasad bismil was actually organized by hra because it was done in 1925 so it was it was done uh, so the years are important guys okay so 1924 we got the hra 1928 it became hsra kakori conspiracy way back 1925 so if you look at this these two statements the first second statement it it is wrong it says the hra was uh, founded by bhagat singh bhagat singh became member of hsra later on okay so clearly not the third case first one it second says bhagat singh renamed bhagat singh did not rename uh, hra it was chandrashekhar azad he was a member that time third statement is correct yes kakori case was 1925 hra so answer has to be only one medium kind of question very easy one because these all the statements are very famous hra itself is very very famous no trick and turn very straight forward question we have asked last question that was there last question was with respect to the super moon 
I'm sure we all have heard this topic of super moon, which is a very important uh, topic that we are dealing with. So what exactly super moon is? Now you know that uh, the if we have the earth and around the earth we have the orbit of the moon, right? Now please remember the moon has this slight orbit around the earth where there is a position when moon comes at the closest location to the earth that closest location is called as the perigee the farthest location of the moon from the earth is known as the apogee okay please remember so what happens when the moon revolves and constantly after every 15 days gap it comes to perigee and after 15 days it goes to apogee approximately 14 to 15 days so when the moon passes closest that is the epigee that that is the perigee when moon is here when moon is at perigee it is at the closest position plus being at perigee it happens to be a full moon then that moon is going to look larger fuller and brighter isn't it because it is already a full moon and it is at perigee which is it as the possible closest location possible so of course it's going to look big that is that is the concept of the super moon so if you look at the question if you look at the question what it says it says the super moon appears as the name says normal moon and what is a super moon super moon is going to be bigger one super moon appear going to be larger fuller brighter yes first is logically correct it super moon has to be bigger one the second statement says the super moon occur when moon is at perigee perigee when it is the closest to the earth and same time it is also full moon yes if it would have been a new moon then cannot be a super moon full moon is when the when the moon well when the moon is going to be appeared as a one complete full round okay so yes both statements are correct answer has to be a uh, this was a very easy one super moon is a very normal concept nothing much to be worried about so these are the uh, questions the guys that we have discussed and i really hope you have enjoyed all these questions so that is all from my side in this uh, part number two i'll see you guys in part number three very very soon best of wish best wishes for your upcoming exams and please do not forget to check out the test series by pmf is and now the test series is just for 499 rupees it's a special price very very special price i would say just go to the description below check out the link and i want you guys to join the test series and get your score better in your upcoming prelims exam for all the personal guidance for all the queries we are all here i'm here if you have anything to any doubt please do let me know in the comment section box thank you so much take care guys see you in the last part number three very soon god bless you